Hi, hello, my name is Gomer Joseph. I hope you've all been having a great day so far. Welcome back to another True Crime Tuesdays video. If you are new, I welcome you. Today, I will be discussing the unsolved case of Joseph Augustus Zarelli, who was also known for years as the boy in the box. Similar to the Eddie Paulette case, this case is pretty much like a local one to me, but unlike Eddie's case, this specific case pretty much became well known worldwide. Researching this case definitely made my head spin, but also left me frustrated that we were only left with more questions. Now, I encourage you all to do your own research with this case and not to just look at my video for all of the information. Here we go. For 65 years, Joseph really wasn't known to the public. So I'll just have to go ahead and start where this tragedy began. On February 25th of 1957, a young man who was in the woods was actually in the woods in the Fox Chase area. And if you don't know what Fox Chase is, it's basically around the Philadelphia area, Susquehanna Road to be exact. But in 1957, Susquehanna Road was not Susquehanna Road. Again, this is just a wooded area. And this young man checked this wooded area to check on his muskrat traps. While checking on his traps, he found something extremely disturbing. He found a child's body inside of a cardboard box used to sell a bassinet with no clothes on him as he was wrapped in a blanket. When you hear this, you would actually expect for the young man or anybody who comes across the body of a child to immediately call the police. Instead, this idiot decides not to, worrying that the police would take his traps. Like, boy, you just need to go ahead and grow up. A day later, a college student stumbled across the body. Like a good citizen, unlike the other guy, he did call the police, even though this college student was a bit nervous to call. When the college student stumbled across this body, he... At first, he assumed that it belonged to somebody else, specifically a girl, because he heard about a disappearance of a little girl from New Jersey who had, you know, gone missing. But unfortunately, she did end up passing away, and her name was Mary Jane Barker. The police did arrive, and as they looked at this body, this child looked like he was about like four to six years old. Examining the body a bit further, they found out that it seemed like this boy wasn't fed. He had bruises and cuts all over his body. They would take the child's fingerprints in hopes that they could at least identify him. But, you know, unfortunately they weren't. And they were baffled that no one would come forward with information about who this kid might have been. Of course, an autopsy would be done and they would find out that this child, that this poor little boy had the life beaten out of him. So investigating further about this boy in a box, they found a man's blue corduroy cap, a child's scarf, and a man's handkerchief with the letter G in the corner of it. Of course, like this story is extremely crazy, especially in 1957, and this eventually catches the media's attention. When the Philadelphia Inquirer was able to get a hold of this story, they printed $400,000 of the image of this battered, deceased child. Once again, nobody was able to identify this little boy. So the police would roam the area, seeing if anyone in the area was looking for a child. No matter what was done, no one was able to identify this little boy. And it's not like they could really just go ahead and keep him in a morgue or a freezer. So months later, he would eventually be buried with the help of donations. Along the way, the police would receive various sort of tips. There would be people who claimed that they saw this boy in a barber shop, that they saw him with a man, but all of these tips really led to nothing. A few years later in 1960, someone who worked in the medical examiner's office, whose name was Remington Bristow, 
contacted a psychic. Now, I have said this in previous videos, I am a born-again Christian, which means that I do not associate with anything like with psychics or anything spiritually similar to it, but Remington did. So after speaking with the psychic, it led him to this foster home in the area. In this foster home, Remington discovered a bassinet which the police could never really trace, yet this bassinet was similar to the one that the, you know, it was similar to the one of the cardboard that the boy was found in. But Remington also found a specific blanket in the foster home, which was similar to the one that the boy was wrapped in. At the time, Remington had this theory that this boy belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the foster home. Now this is Remington's point of view. He just believes that the stepdaughter and you know her stepfather got rid of the boy so that no one would find out that she had a child out of wedlock. Again, this is the late 50s and the early 1960s. Unwed mothers were looked down and it wasn't like the police found a newborn though. Not that it gives you an excuse to take the life of your own child, but even though, you know, because, you know, this boy was small, like, he was clearly, you know, a quote-unquote baby, but he looked older than what a newborn would look like. So I just don't see why you would keep him a secret for so long just to eventually take his life. The police would look into this further, but they found no foul play. A year later, in 1961, there was a couple who worked with many carnivals and were arrested for taking the life of one of their 10 children. Why you have kids and decide to one day take their life is something I honestly will never understand. But come to find out this crazy carnival couple had other missing children and since there were a few other kids who were missing the police felt like maybe this crazy carnival couple had something to do with the boy in the box and you know thinking that one of the missing kids were probably the boy in the box when these evil diabolic demonic parents were questioned they admitted where the other kids that they got rid of were buried but stated that they never went to Philadelphia. At this point, this is decades later and this case is still cold in 1998. Of course, this is decades later so it is pretty much no surprise that new investigators will get involved and unfortunately Remington did pass away a few years prior, never knowing who this boy was. And he really spent the rest of his life truly working hard to see if he could solve this mystery. So in 1998, it is discovered that the man who ran the foster home and his stepdaughter were a nasty pair because they eventually got married. Now I get it, like I get that that wasn't his biological daughter, but how in the world are you going to go ahead and marry a woman and I would assume that he divorced this woman and how in the world do you just proceed to marry her daughter like that is just um, that's just nasty so of course the police interviewed them and in my opinion I feel like the police felt like they had to check this foster home again because you know this foster home was beginning to look like something straight out of flowers in the attic but after questioning the weird couple um, it was pretty much found out that the foster home had no ties to the passing of this boy in the box. And of course, since 1957 to 1998, technology had improved. So the police felt like they had to pretty much exhume his body. And if you don't know what that really means, it pretty much means that his body had to be dug up from the grave. And they were really hoping that with the technology that they found, um, they pretty much exhumed his body to take his tooth out to see if they could go ahead and match any dental records. But unfortunately, they still weren't able to match anything. A few years later, in 2002, 
there was a woman named Martha, but she was also known as M. I don't know, in my opinion, like that sounds like something that comes like straight out of the X-Men, but let me know, let me not go ahead and trail off. So I'm just gonna call her Martha. So Martha came to the police claiming that her mother, when she was younger, she claimed that her mother had bought a boy, but after buying this boy, she would soon abuse him. Martha goes on to say that her mother would continue to abuse this boy to the point where she took his life and got rid of him, claiming that this boy she was speaking of was the boy in the box. So of course the police did look into this more, but long story short, they eventually found out that this lady was cuckoo for Coca Bus. Like the neighbors, you know, the police spoke with the neighbors and the neighbors are saying like, yeah, that woman, um, she's crazy. And yeah, there was never a boy in that house to begin with. So the police felt like Martha's claims were pretty much a waste of time and dismissed the claims that she made. In 2008, there was a forensic artist named Frank Bender who pretty much had this theory that this boy was raised as a girl. His reason for thinking that was that the boy had this, un, you know, this unprofessional haircut done on him. So he drew the image of this boy with long hair, hoping that it would spark some new information, but instead it did spark nothing. Now in 2016, two writers named Jim Hoffman and Louis Romano thought that they could match the DNA of the boy in the box with someone who had passed away in Memphis, Tennessee, wondering if there was some sort of family relation. A DNA test would be done, but come to find out there was no connection at all between this man who passed and the boy in the box. Once again in 2019, his body was exhumed to gather more DNA samples, but a few years later, it seems like something would actually come out of it. On November 30th of 2022, after 65 years later, after doing genetic testing, the police announced that they discovered the identity of this boy. On December 8th of 2022, the police revealed that the name of this boy was Joseph Augustus Zarelli, who was four years old when he passed and he was born on January 13th of 1953. Sadly, but strangely, there were really no pictures of him except something you know, that was really drawn up by investigators of how he most likely looked at or how he most likely looked like when he disappeared. And of course, like this was like big news. And of course, this is like recent news, like, you know, for decades, like the nation, the world were really trying to find out who this boy was. But now we are just faced with even having more questions. Like, it's really a shame that, you know, there's like this boy went four years without anybody taking any photographs of him at all. Because when I found this out, like, of course, you know, praise God, they were able to identify this boy but then my next question was like, who exactly did he come from? Like, who were his parents? Because you mean to tell me that this boy has gone missing for decades and no one, nobody, nobody was able to identify him or even report Joseph missing. In January of this year, it was actually revealed of the identity of Joseph's parents. Now his parents' names were Augustus Gus Zarelli and Mary, who went by Betsy Elizabeth. Betsy, she actually passed away in the 90s. I believe it was due to cancer. And Gus, he passed away in like 2014. But the thing about it is that Joseph also has siblings, but I don't really believe that his siblings have, you know, their identities out there like that. As I look deeper to see, you know, what I can find about Joseph's family life, about what I can find out about his parents, it was just, it just baffled my mind about how it was unclear whether Betsy gave Joseph up for adoption or not. It was also unclear whether Gus 
even knew that he had a son named Joseph. Like, I, I truly do not get it. Like, this is really frustrating. Like, how in the world does a boy become born one moment, then mysteriously pass the next? Like, you have his birth certificate, and then all of a sudden, you have him, you know, passing looking so bruised and beaten and just in between those years it's just it's just a big gap of nothingness now i really don't know how you know cps was done back in the 50s but like the, the thing like like again like there was no record of adoption or there was no record of anybody even reporting joseph missing like what like what happened in between the time that he was born to the time that he passed away. Naturally, many people assume that Joseph's parents had something to do with his passing, but people who knew the couple personally state that they have never seen Betsy harm any of her kids and didn't see her as the type of person who would ever lay a hand on her children. The family members who are alive pretty much state how surprised that they were that Joseph was the boy in the backs all these years. And I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that the family always knew of Joseph, but didn't know him personally because either, you know, you felt like you lost contact with Joseph or whether you always heard about Joseph or you just really never knew what came of him. Honestly, I don't know. Though the decades old mystery of who this boy in the box was, the police, you know, are still trying to figure out exactly who took his life. Now, I encourage you all, I mean, of course, like be a snitch. And I know that this happened years ago, but sometimes, you know, little things fall through the cracks decades later. Like sometimes there are these generational tales that we hear of, but that we keep to ourselves. But if you are watching this and you have any information at all, like please call 911 or call the Philadelphia Police Department, which is 215-686. 8477. If Joseph were alive today, he would be like 70 years old. Even though I have no information at all about how he lived his short life, we just have to really be comforted in the fact that only God knows what happened in between those years. But still, it really is a shame that his life was lost so quickly and so brutally but that it's also a shame it's also very heartbreaking that no one really remembers what he was like and that is truly a tragedy again if joseph was alive he would be 70 years old and it really took over 60 years to even find out his name realistically i know that it's not likely that the person who took his life will face justice or be charged for his crime because most likely they're not even alive anymore. But if they did not repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ alone to save them, then this person who took Joseph's life had another thing coming. The God that I serve, the God of the Bible, is a God of justice. He knows exactly what happened to Joseph that day and will make sure that whoever was responsible will pay. I thank you all for taking the time in your day to watch this video. If you did like this video, please feel free to hit the like button. If you have any thoughts on this case at all, please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. If you'd like to see more videos from me, please feel free to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about the next video. If there is a certain true crime case that you'd like me to cover, go ahead and let me know. I will see y'all for next True Crime Tuesdays and I will talk to y'all later.